Okay, so this is going to be part B of our um, outline, our recording on blood vessels as we kind of finish this thing up. Hopefully you watched the, um, the two uh, drawings that I told you to watch and make sure, the, actually the four drawings, so we can actually see the drawings uh, of uh, both. Uh, let me see if I can enlarge this real quickly. Okay, so if we can see the drawings should have seen them of well we'll just move it up like this okay just saw the drawings of the arteries drawings of the veins you should have saw the blood supply to the brain and drainage from blood from the brain as well as the fetal circulation so now we're going to kind of fill in all the blanks here the one we didn't cover was the hepatic portal circulation and there is in your packet um, a page that kind of shows the hepatic portal circulation so i'll go over that when we uh, do our live zoom session so you can have that um, just so you'll know exactly what page that's on let me find it for you so that's on page 27 of your packet so if I enlarge this here you can see this picture this covers your hepatic portal circulation here and it's already all filled in and labeled for you all right so everything is complete in there all right already so make sure that you're well aware of that and have a hard time moving it the right direction in this picture uh, but that's kind of what we're going to fill out on the notes here so as you re review that picture it'll help kind of bring all that to light and help you kind of understand a little bit more about what's going on with that so let's fill out these um notes here all right so under hepatic portal circulation a portal system as we talked about when we did the intro to the blood vessels uh, carries blood between two capillary networks without having to go through the heart first so number two the hepatic portal circulation so what goes in the blank carries blood from the capillaries of all our gi tract our digestive organs and the spleen takes it to sinusoids capillary networks right and the sinuses of blood from uh, from uh, gas the GI tract sinusoids of the liver and the liver is going to store modify okay or detoxify some of those substances all right that have been absorbed so our liver is kind of the thing that detoxes all those different things that we consume and eat and digest and drink all right so when you eat that um, bag next bag of uh, flaming hot cheetos and you read all the ingredients on there and you can't really make out half of those names um, you'll know essentially what's happening there is that all that stuff's going into your liver and the liver is going to detoxify and clean all that up for us before it takes that blood and passes it back Back into the heart okay um, so uh, the hepatic portal system number three includes all the veins that drain blood from the pancreas the spleen our stomach our intestines the gallbladder and take it to what's called the hepatic portal vein so the hepatic portal vein is formed by the union of two other veins and you can see that here's the hepatic portal vein right here it's formed by the merger of the superior mesenteric vein Okay, which drains blood from the small intestine, part of the large intestine, as well as the stomach and the pancreas, right? And the splenic vein, all right? And the splenic vein drains blood from the spleen, obviously, as well as uh, tributaries that come from our stomach, pancreas, part of our large intestine. So make sure you know that hepatic and portal veins formed by the union of the splenic and superior mesenteric veins. What that does, the liver also receives oxygenated blood, obviously, from the hepatic artery itself. And then all blood is going to leave the liver by way of the hepatic veins. So really simply, our intestines and all our GI tract and the organs that are associated with that are going to drain blood into the hepatic portal vein, which enters into the liver. Then blood is drained from the liver by the hepatic veins, right? And the hepatic artery is what supplies blood to the liver. Okay, let's move on our notes to uh, the pulmonary circulation. So under pulmonary circulation, uh, essentially this, go back to your drawing that we did in the very beginning when we did uh, the heart. Pulmonary circulation takes deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the air sacs of the lungs and returns oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium. So the pulmonary trunk emerges from the right ventricle and divides into the right and left pulmonary arteries which enter and branch within the lungs. Now, something really important to note here, okay? Um, on almost all our drawings, arteries are red and veins are blue. There are two exceptions to this. Number one, exception is pulmonary circulation. If you remember, the pulmonary trunk, which becomes the pulmonary arteries in our model, is blue. And it's blue because of the fact that that is deoxygenated blood, all right? We're taking it to the lungs to pick up oxygen. But 
It's called the artery, okay, because of the fact that it's leaving the heart. So we said blood vessels that leave the heart are called arteries. The ones that bring blood back into the heart are, are veins. Now, once we go through the lungs, we're going to oxygenate that blood, and it returns into the heart, to the left atrium, by way of the pulmonary veins, which are red in our models. So pulmonary circulation is the one place that the colors are switched in our vessels, right? The other place is going to be in fetal circulation because, again, uh, the, the oxygen in the blood is supplied by mom, right? So when we get to that drawing and you look at that drawing, hopefully when you looked at that and trace that all out, you made a note that the pulmonary or, or the, uh, um, the uh, arteries in the fetus, okay, uh, are uh, blue and the veins, okay, are red. All right, so there's a difference there. So in pulmonary and fetal circulation, that's where we switch the red and blue colors, okay? Uh, number two, back to pulmonary circulation. Pulmonary trunk emerges from the right ventricle and divides into the right and left pulmonary arteries that branch into the lungs. After gas exchange occurs in the capillary level there, oxygenated blood then flows into the two pulmonary veins that are gonna enter into the left atrium. All right, so pulmonary and systemic circulations are different, and they're different in several ways. They're listed here. First, blood in the pulmonary circulation doesn't need to be pumped as far as in the systemic, since our lungs are right next to our heart. So pulmonary arteries have larger diameters but thinner walls, less elastic tissue, so resistance to blood flow tends to be low, and the pressure then, okay, is low, all right, as it moves to the lungs. As a result, normal, area, uh, normal pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure is lower than the average in the systemic circulation, okay, which is straightforward, and we would understand that, obviously. Um, once you get to physio, you'll cover that more in detail, all right? So we want to go to the next picture here, and don't let this picture really confuse you or bother you a whole lot, okay, because we're going to go into more detail um, uh, with that, uh, we did already. I'll just say we did go into more detail with that when you looked at your, um, with your with your drawing. Okay, when we did fetal circulation drawing. Okay, so here's the picture of that. So we got to fill in some blanks here, as we did when we did the drawing of the baby. Right. Sorry about that interruption, but if you take the picture of the baby and pull it out as we go through this, we can fill in some of these terms. Although you see them also up here on the picture as well. Okay, so for fetal circulation, uh, permits the uh, fetus to obtain the oxygen nutrients from mom's blood, okay, eliminate CO2 and waste in mom's blood as well, maternal blood. Okay, we're having some problems with our image here, so hopefully we can pull our image up and still work with that. Okay, um, let's go back and hopefully pick up at the right place here. All right, uh, exchange of substances number two between fetal blood and maternal blood occurs through the placenta, as you can see, the placenta down here at the bottom. All right, and the placenta essentially attaches to the navel or the umbilicus of the fetus by the umbilical cord. Deoxygenated blood flows from the fetus to the placenta by way of two umbilical arteries. Remember, we have the two umbilical arteries, which you see right here, and they're wrapping around, okay? Oxygenated blood returns from the placenta to the fetus by way of the one umbilical vein, which delivers its blood primarily to the ductus venosus right here. You see your ductus venosus, which is going to drain into the uh, inferior vena cava, all right? So you'll see that umbilical vein is red. Okay, the umbilical arteries are a little more on the blue side. It doesn't show quite as blue right here in this picture, all right? Since the fetal lungs don't operate, we have some bypass systems, right? Blood doesn't flow from the right ventricle to the lungs. Structural features allow this bypass include, first of all, the foramen ovale, which is essentially the hole between the right and left atria. And the second one is the ductus arteriosus, which is our bypass right here, which permits blood in the pulmonary trunk to go directly into the aorta. After birth, okay, uh, when pulmonary, renal, and digestive function begins, we start to breathe on our own and uh, use our lungs. Special features aren't needed anymore, and they go change, undergo changes. They basically shrivel up for the most part. So we have some new terms for these, all right? The distal portion of the umbilical arteries become the medial umbilical ligaments. There we go, right there. So the medial umbilical ligaments right there, all right? The umbilical vein collapses here, but remains as the ligamentum teres, or what's also known as the round ligament. The ductus venosus is going to collapse, become the ligamentum venosum. 
All right. Placenta gets expelled as the afterbirth. The foramen ovale will close up and become the fossa ovalis. And the ductus arteriosus is going to shrivel up, become the ligamentum arteriosum. All right. So that's it for that. Uh, under aging in the cardiovascular system, effects of aging are going to include several different things here. Uh, so underneath the effects of aging in your uh, outline here, a couple of different things. Uh, you have decreased compliance. The aorta does not uh, uh, extend as well. You get a reduction in the size of the muscle fibers as we do in skeletal muscle as well. Uh, cardiac muscle strength then is going to decrease with age, reducing in a, a lower output and a decline in the maximum heart rate. You have an increase in systolic blood pressure, which is the top number in your blood pressure. Uh, increases in things like blood cholesterol uh, and LDL levels. Uh, increase along with a decrease in HDL levels and increased risk, obviously, of things like coronary artery, artery disease, congestive heart failure, and atherosclerosis of the arteries. Okay, so that would, uh, that would conclude um, everything for blood vessels and a lot of models to look at and know and practice with and learn those uh, uh, labels for all the blood vessels that you'll see in Dr. Ward's atlas. All right, so that's it for part B of blood vessels.